Welcome to today's video in which I want to share with you how the recently announced feature of structured outputs by OpenAI can benefit use cases in NIME. To start with, let's spend some time to understand what structured outputs are. So in general, structured outputs allow developers to define a response format, so-called JSON schemas, that the language model will adhere to when providing a response. So let's assume that we want always to have a field that is called key, and we want then the large language model, model to provide a response in the as value. Then it will always respond in this format that we see in these brackets, curly brackets. And that's very important in using large language model in applications. So imagine that you have built a chat application and you want your chat application to access the current weather and to output it to the user. So in order for that to work, your large language model needs to be able to, first of all, extract the data from the user query. So for example, the location and the current date, and then convert that into a format that is compatible with the external service or the external API that it sends a request to, to obtain the weather data. This only works if the LLM can do that reliably. And that used to be a problem in the past. In their blog post that they released for this feature, they also shared some information about the performance. And if we look at that, there were different techniques. So this concept is not entirely new that large language models are used to generate a structured output to then use in downstream applications. And originally this was done by prompt engineering. So these, that are the orange bars. And if you look at the first bar with one of the earlier versions of GPT-4, we were at below 40% reliability. So to speak, if you go back to the example with that chat app with the weather API, six out of 10 times, the request to the external API would fail and a correct answer can't be provided. So over time, as models got more fine-tuned for that use case, performance increased. So here we are already at around 90%. And what this new feature allows, the structured output feature, is to get this to a whopping 100%. So when you set a JSON schema to be strictly enforced, so there's a parameter strict that can equal true, then we get with the latest model 100% reliability, and that can be a real game changer. Let's be a little bit more concrete and understand one of the use cases that they shared in their blog post about separating a final answer from reasoning steps. What does it mean? It means that in a first step, a developer would define a response format. So in layman's terms, the developer would say, always give me when you respond a field with your reasoning steps. And behind that field of reasoning steps, I want to have a list of sentences for each of the reasoning steps that you provided. And then give me another field that just has a paragraph containing the final answer. When then a question is sent to the large language model, for example, Jim was born on 12 March 2000 and John was born on 12 April 2000, who was older. Explain your reasoning step by step. Then the large language model should respond like this. It would give an, uh, the reasoning steps field with a list. So we see the square brackets and in there we see the reasoning. March comes before April. As Jim and John were both born in 2000, the person born in the earlier months is older. As Jim was born in March, he is older than John. So that is the detailed reasoning. And under the final answer field, we just get Jim is older than John. So straight away, the answer. When I read that, I immediately thought about some interesting use cases that this can have in NIME. And I've been working on five of them that I want to share with you in a demonstration in just a little bit. So the first use case that I tried was actually building a chat app that does exactly what I just shared with you, separating a final answer to a question from the reasoning steps. So that will be a, a chat app with a composite view. The second step that I thought of was using this to extract structured data from unstructured data sources. So I've built a component for that as well. 
And the very same component I then used for the third use case, which is workflow routing. So the great thing about the structured output is that you can also define the response options. So imagine that you give your large language model a drop down menu of response options and it can only pick from those options. And that we can use for routing data through different branches using the switch case switch functionality in I'm. The next use case that I thought about was labeling or categorizing my own emails. So I connect to my Gmail account, download some emails and ask the model to categorize it, but also to give me a summarization in a separate field. And the last use case that I'm really excited about is LLM routing. So for this, I used the example chat app that was provided by the NIME team on the NIME hub. And I modified it under the hood to use that component again to first send whatever the user puts into the chat to a GPT model to evaluate how complex it is. And depending on that, a model is chosen. So that can either be one of the models that are available via the chat GPT API, or I've given it some options of models that I run locally via Olama. So, so far for the introduction, let's take a moment and move over to NIME. And let's start looking into the use cases. So before I get started with that, maybe one word of caution. Throughout this video, you will be able to see some API keys that I've used. Don't bother. Before this video sees the light of day, I will have revoked them all. So with that said, let's now get started and let's look at this first component. So for this use case, I've built an interactive data app with a composite view. And when I open this, it's structured fairly simply. You have inputs for the API key, selection of models that can be chosen from the drop-down menu, and then we can give a system message and a user query. So I opted for a question that I found online that is used to assess a large language model's reasoning capability. It's about uh, asking the model how long 20 shirts take to dry if five shirts drying in the sun take four hours. So once this update button is hit, this query is being sent to the OpenAI API to the chosen model. And the response is then passed into two tables. So one is the answer. So 20 shirts would also take four hours to dry if they have the same exposure to drying conditions as the five shirts did. So that's exactly the right answer. And a little bit further down, there's a second table, which provides the uh, reasoning steps. So I won't read through that uh, step by step. You can pause and do that yourself. But this was a pretty, pretty good answer. But I mean, it's also the one of the most powerful state of the art models out there right now. So the limitations of this data app are that the schema, so the response formatted format is hard coded inside this component. So it wasn't really flexible. That's why I tried to bring in some flexibility in the second use case, which is about extracting structured data from an unstructured data source. So for this, I created some artificial data. So very simple and short, just some data about someone who's purchased something at a certain date at a certain price. I tried to put in some traps for the model here, for example, by calling contract price in the first row and contract value in the second, labeling the purchase as purchased in the top row and product in the bottom. And I then created this component, which does not have a composite view anymore. So there's no magnifying glass in this top right corner. And I've moved all these topics that needed to be configured into the configuration dialog. So again, an API key, a model selection, and a system message. And now I also included a field for a JSON schema. And in the schema, I've defined four fields, customer name, product name, contract value and the date of the agreement. You get one table out, which has one column for each of the fields that were defined. And as you can see, um, it nailed it pretty much. So very reliable outputs and it even passed the date into a standard format. So that makes it very easily to process further in NIME. 
So this was actually very uh, a brief example and a very short data set. So given that in this week's Just Name It challenge, we were asked to extract data from 100 PDF investment agreements. I reused this exact component on a subset of the data, which we can see here. So with the ticker parser node, or I grabbed all the different investment agreements. I then filtered out two rows of data and ran it through the same um, component. And also here, despite the fact that obviously the corpus of text was much larger, it reliably extracted the information um, in a structured way without giving any errors. So I think this can be quite a popular use case in the future on even more unstructured data. One thing that I came across on YouTube was a guy who's doing videos on um, investment things. And he actually used the structured outputs to run it over transcripts from investment press conferen conferences that the NVIDIA CEO gave with the, ob with the objective to extract any company that he named and what he said about them. And the purpose was to identify potential investment opportunities by then researching those companies further. Let's move back to the examples and scroll down to the third use case. So I mentioned it in the introduction already. You can also define a schema that limits for a certain field the response option. So that's this, let's call it drop-down functionality, where the model is forced to choose from a range of values that you actually provide to that. With that in mind, I thought about a use case where it can classify documents and depending on the classification, downstream a different workflow branch via a case switch node is activated. So for this, I grabbed 17 invoices and purchase orders in PDF format that I found online. And I used it, I used the same component. So all I changed was the schema. Funnily enough, I even forgot to change the prompt to the model, the system prompt. And in the schema, I only defined one field, which is a document type. And I passed another parameter, uh, which is the enum. And enum allows to provide a list. So in square brackets of response options. And this forces the model to only respond either with invoice or purchase order. And running this on the test data, let's expand this table, make this a bit bigger. You can see that it was very reliable, 100% spot on. Only responded with invoice or purchase order. And also the allocation is matching perfectly. So with this new column document type, I then used the new expressions node and the switch functionality to create a new column routing where the value is zero if it's an invoice, where it's one if it's a purchase order, and just in case that the model hallucinates or that it's not 100% accurate and there's a different value in there, it will output two. So now we have a table with the routing column with values zero, one, or two. I mean, it doesn't have two in this case. And what we can do with that is we can now iterate over that. So I use a chunk loop to do that. And then uh, we turn the routing column into a variable and use this variable to activate either the top part if it's zero, so that's an invoice. And then we could process that row as an invoice. As uh, for one, it activates the middle part. So then it goes to purchase order processing and um, if it's anything else, then we have an exception process. So I haven't implemented these meta nodes, so these are just placeholders, but obviously this can also be a, an interesting use case for structured outputs in NIME workflows. Moving on to the fourth use case. Here I now thought about how I could use this personally to make my life a little bit simpler. So what I did is I used the NIME email processing extension to connect to my Gmail account. And I generated some fake data using ChatGPT and sent three emails of different purposes to my YouTube channel Gmail account. So we can see these here. 
And uh, what I then did is um, later on, I also send it to the OpenAI API. However, I before I did that, I thought about the implications in regards to data privacy. I personally wouldn't feel comfortable to send my personal emails, including names of the people that sent me an email, phone numbers and stuff like that to an external service. So I took the opportunity to experiment with the Presidio features, Microsoft Presidio features that allow for um, named entity extraction and anonymization. So the way that this works is I use a text column from my email and use the Presidio analyzer to analyze it. And this then outputs a table of all the different um, entity types and entities that it finds. So that can be a person, a date, a phone number, URL, and so on and so forth. And I can then use a Presidio anonymizer to anonymize all the names and phone numbers. So if we inspect this column filter where I only have the original email and the anonymization result, you can see what I was talking about. So um, it was addressed to Laura Reed and it's now person one in the anonymization result and also in the signature where you typically have phone numbers it all gets nicely anonymized and replaced. And now that allows me to send this anonymized part to the large language model. So that's exactly what is being done here. So let's run that. And while that's running, maybe some explanation, we look at the schema in a moment. So for this use case, I wanted it to uh, provide me with a response as an email type and an email summary. So you can see that work quite nicely. We get one additional column with the email type and one with the email summary. And in the schema, the email type again has this enumerator. So a list of response options, which can be accounts receivable, purchase order, lead, project query or other. And then a field for the email summary. And also it's stuck and adhered to the schema reliably once again. And then in the next step, I can use the um, let's call it model that was generated by this anonymizer to de-anonymize. So I do that once for the email summary column and once for the input column. And if we now check out this table and look at the input specifically, you can see that all the names got put in back again. So also very cool feature. And if you think about it, this could now be paired with the use case three so that I could uh, define a routing and let's say route an email that is classified as a lead into a branch where I maybe use this component again to extract uh, a customer name and summarize a query and extract phone numbers and so on and so forth to then put it into my CRM database. And I could define different handling of emails for um, other types of emails. Let's now go to the last use case um, where I make a large language model decide what is the best model to provide an answer to a certain user query. So this is the chat app that was provided by the NIME team as an example on the NIME hub. And I'll actually go in this for a moment to talk about some of the changes. So you can see my component here again. Um, it's the same, still the same component, just with a different schema. And what I've done here is I've modified the system prompt. So the model is asked to make a decision uh, regarding the best, the model best suited to answer the user request. And I then provide some commentary around the models that are available. So that's GPT-4 mini for difficult tasks. Then I have a locally running a coding model and like a smaller all rounder model with 8 billion parameters and a fairly small model for, let's say, task of low complexity. And the same models you can find as an enum in the uh, model selection field that I've defined. So once uh, a model is being picked, we turn that model selection into a variable. And this variable is then used to filter a table that for now I've created manually. And in this table, 
we find again the model names and then the base URL that we need to configure the um, OpenAI Authenticator and Chat Model Connector nodes. So the base URL for the locally running models is my Olama endpoint and for GPT-4 Mini it's just a default OpenAI endpoint. And that is used, the base URL is used in here in the Authenticator and advanced settings. I use this variable to define the base URL and the model that was selected is then used in the chat model connector to end is passed to the specific model ID. And that connection is then passed to the chat model prompter and the chat model prompter then gets the original user query as well. And that is when the real answer is being generated. What I then do is once the response comes in, I at the model name that was answering ahead in front of the actual response that was provided so that we can keep track of that. And that's what I now want to play around with a little bit. So let's go to the composite view. And what that's loading for the first time, I'll also go to my questions on my other screen that I want to use. That actually took way longer than what is normal, but finally it worked. I think my recording software is occupying some of my VRAM and that's why it was a bit slow. But let's look at what happened. So the default question is write a Python script that outputs a value zero to one. So naturally this is a coding question. And as I would have expected, the, more, the request got routed to my local coding model and it's providing a response. The coding model is around an 8 billion parameter model. Normally that runs quite quickly, but it looks like when recording it's a bit slowish. And let's now change the question and give it a simple math problem. So in the past, this was triggering one of the smaller models. So that should still be quick enough. Let's send that message and give it a moment. And there we go. That was a bit quicker. And as you can see, it was my small phi 3 model that was answering. So now let's do one last test with a reasoning, um, reasoning problem. Let's take the shirt problem once again. So that one should be hopefully quick because that should go to GPT-4 or mini. As expected, the model that answered was GPT-4 or mini and the response was quite fast. So this pretty much proves a point that we can also use structural output for large language model rounding. So that can also be a potential popular use case can, because that can save you quite, quite a bit of money. Obviously my prompt engineering skills are very limited, but I'm still very happy that I could make this work reliably for this demonstration. And honestly, that was it that I had prepared for today. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, then I invite you to join me on my mission to beat that YouTube algorithm. You know what it, that means? Click subscribe, comment, like, share with your friends that need to see this and help me make this bigger so that I can create more content like that. I will publish all the workflows and examples, excluding my personal information to the Nime Hub in a little bit where you can access that. And I'll also look into if it's possible to turn that component that I've been reusing a lot anyways into a shared component and maybe make it even a bit easier. Thanks all for watching and I'll catch you next time. Bye bye.